particular the Mars problem, which most of us didn't realize was a problem. Um, but we're here to find out what that problem is and maybe a solution to it. Um, Kevin will talk for 40 minutes, an hour. We'll open it up for any kinds of questions that people have. It's very informal. This is really our first science series like this, so we hope it goes well. We're open to suggestions. People that you know who you think would do well, welcome to suggest, and we'll, we'll arrange it up. Um, help yourself to popcorn, water, apple juice, lemonade, and let's just all have a good time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. Like, this is awesomely informal, so if we want to start throwing questions at me in the middle, we can, but then we risk all having to stay here until the end. Mm. <laughs> so maybe save the questions at the end, and people that want to stick around and talk, awesome. And anyone else can go wherever you're going to go. Now, we had some technical problems here. I had some technical problems. These guys don't have any technical problems. I had a lot of technical problems, so my machine's down there. It's gone. We're I don't know what movies are going to play. I filled this with a bunch of awesome movies of things colliding and things exploding. <laughs> I don't know which are going to play. So everyone's going to be a mystery. We may need to applaud everyone that actually works. So uh, as you said, I'm Kevin Walsh. I work in Boulder at the Southwest Research Institute, uh, specifically with the NASA Lunar Science Institute. So uh, we're going to talk about the moon a little bit, but we're going to talk about more Mars more than that. So uh, let's roll. All right, this is our solar system today, roughly. This is our scale, the unit of measure I'm going to use all the time. The unit that we care about in the solar system for scale, 1 AU is the distance from the sun to the earth. And everything else we're going to measure in AUs. Jupiter's out at 5, Pluto's out here at 30-something, Saturn's around 10, Mars is at 1.5. That's our unit, that's what we're going to roll with. Now, what's great about the solar system is it didn't always look like this. This is today. This is what we're working with. We want to work backwards with as many tools as we have and with as much evidence from other solar systems and other stars as possible to figure out how we got to be like this. That's our goal. So the real big questions, where did the planets actually come from? Like, where did the planets come from? Why do we have a big moon? Our moon's awesome. It's surprisingly large compared to the moons of all the other systems or all the other planets. What, what's up with the moon? Why do we have asteroids and comets? Some planets, our planets have a huge diversity. From Mercury with an enormous iron core that's almost 85% of its radius out to these gas giants, Saturn is so light and fluffy it would float if you could put it in water. It's less dense than water. And have the planets always been where we see them now? specifically their distance from the sun? This is a big question, and in the end, it's actually going to be a big answer to a lot of our other questions. So we start at step one. How do stars actually form? And then the planets forming around them. So these, this is a big spiral galaxy. Our Milky Way looks a lot like this. We see awesome, gorgeous little spiral arms. We see all these lines of dust and big, bright stars. And in them, when we zoom in with Hubble, we take pictures of these gorgeous, gorgeous arcs of gas. And this column of gas is sitting next to a cluster of really young stars. When a bunch of stars all form together, the youngest ones, the biggest ones, burn out in five million years and they shoot out crazy super hot solar winds, a lot of mass, a lot of velocity, and they compress the dust and the gas and they blast it all away. All these little points right there are little star systems that are kind of shielding the gas behind it. So kind of silhouetting all that gas. And that's why we see all those weird little lines. All these really bright stars are just bombarding it with, with uh, solar wind. And because of that, chunks of gas, oh, chunks of gas become gravitationally bound to each other and they collapse. They get compressed by a supernova or the solar wind. The gas starts falling in on itself. That's what we're seeing in these two movies, which didn't work. Urgh. The standard example you get in college or in high school, the reason that we go from a big ball of gas to a spinning disk rotating around a central star is the conservation of angular momentum. You take this huge big ball of gas and has a little bit of rotation. And that's like your ice skater with his arms out. As that gas condenses and collapses on itself, that rotation, you conserve the angular momentum, the rotation increases, there's friction from the gas, and you see this big ball of gas, like this, collapsing down to a disk. In the center, 
The densest, hottest part is where your star builds and ignites. And outside of it, you get a disk of gas surrounding it, rotating around it. So we still don't have planets. So what tools do we actually have in this disk to build our planets? So when we start to actually get solid material, the solid material can collide with each other. So we get collisions. That's fun. That's good. And gravitational forces. These little pieces of dust aren't very big, not a whole lot of mass. But once you start to build up, our bigger guys can actually start grabbing onto each other, and we can start building up with gravity. So this first step is actually really, really challenging and still a big mystery in planetary science. This is the best we've got, is that the dust starts to fall to the center of the plane of this gas disk going around the star. Because of the gravity with each other, they fall to the center, they start to encounter each other, and they can start sticking together, kind of like dust grains sticking to dust grains. We start to build up, we take a couple magic leaps, and we end up with with the problem, <laughs> with a big problem. We'll start that over again. Um, where were we? We'll skip that and go to this. OK, so we invoked a fair bit of magic. But our dust grains start sticking together, and they start to build our asteroids. Our asteroids start colliding, and they start to build bigger asteroids. And so eventually, we've built up a population of small bodies, things much smaller than the moon. Big asteroids, something like 100 kilometers across. And they're different depending on where they're being born in the solar system. The closer you are to the sun, the hotter the material, and things like water, methane, ammonia, these really light volatile gases and materials it's too hot for them. So the things that are born here are rocky and stony. Way out here, when the temperature drops below the temperature where ice can actually form, you can then condense, you can take ice and take ammonia and methane, and you can build those into your icy bodies. So we kind of have a composition difference here. The inner stuff are the rocky, stony things, lots of iron stuff, and out here, lots of icy stuff. So the further you get away, the more and more ice you get, and you get a, this gradient across the solar system. So first, let's build stuff out of the rocky guys. Oh, you're not going to run, are you? Who thinks this one's going to run? I do. Oh! Floating. All right. Let's see what we got. Well, all right. We could act this one out. <laughs> so this is our material. We have our sun, we've got really rocky stuff, less rocky stuff, and we start to mix in some water as we get further away. And we've got our big boys out here, Jupiter. If this guy were operating, we'd see how quickly these dudes start to form together and would build bigger and bigger bodies until after about 100 or 200 million years, we grow into something like this. We built Three planets down here, we've got four. We're missing Mercury, but that's a detail. We don't need to worry about Mercury. We've got our model Venus, we've got our model Earth, we've got our model Mars. All right, that's pretty convincing. Our numerical models, we can take our big asteroids that we built, we put them in orbits around the sun, do their collisions, accreting together, we can actually build our rocky planets. Our models do pretty well. They don't build any crazy planets out here where we don't see them in the asteroid belt. Just a few leftovers. Those are gonna be our asteroids. So that's a pretty good first step. Now our moon. We're doing our tour of the solar system here. The next really interesting thing we want to talk about with these rocky bodies is our moon. We have a large single moon. And one particular property that tells a story about the moon is its iron core. Big, big bodies the size of the moon or the size of the Earth, they're so big they contain so much heat from the accretion of all their material and radioactive materials in their interior, they melt entirely. And the heavy iron stuff sinks to the center, and the lighter stuff, like rocks and stones, stay up on the top. We have a heavy iron core, we still have a liquid core that's rotating, that gives us our magnetic field. The moon has a very, very small iron core, way too small, it formed in the same region where the Earth formed. 
But chemically, the moon looks just like the Earth. So this is a problem for our models. How did the moon form this big out of the same sort of stuff that the Earth formed from, but miss out on all of that iron? Where did all of the moon's iron go? And so this was a big constraint for our models. I'm afraid to play that movie, actually. I'm afraid I'm going to crash this. But let's, I'll let it load. So what we found out when we actually started making models of these collisions, where we have a model Earth with a big core and a model impact, or something the size of Mars with a core the size it, it should have, is that when you get a collision, like the collisions that we had when the Earth was building, you can essentially swap cores. The collision is so catastrophic that a bunch of the iron from that impactor gets taken into the core of the Earth, and all of this debris that's left orbiting our Earth is all the rocky stuff on the surface and just a little bit of the iron. And so this was the big solution, the big key to understanding where the Earth's moon came from. That something the size of Mars hit Earth about 50 million years into the evolution of the solar system gave the Earth a bunch of iron and accreted outside the Earth into the actual moon that we see today. Oh, wait, should I try it? Yeah. All right, we'll try it. Well, actually, let's try this guy. This guy's way cooler. Nope. All right, we'll try this dude. Nope. Ouch. <laughs> Brutal. Sorry. I'm really, really sorry. This one's not found. Uh, this one's on the drive. We can, we can play this one afterwards, and it's totally worth it. So what this, the other consequence of forming the moon this way is that the moon formed out of all the debris following this collision. The moon essentially accreted really, really close to the Earth. Now, that's not where we find the moon today. The moon currently resides about 60 Earth radii away from the Earth. It orbits in 28 something days and we rotate in 24 hours. But there's a constant exchange of angular momentum between the two. So we can work backwards in time to estimate what the system was like right after the formation. Our models show us that the moon would accrete at like three or four or five Earth radii, which means the Earth was spinning in about five hours. The Earth day was about five hours back then. And over time, because of the tides, the same tides that control our oceans, We've exchanged angular momentum and pushed the moon all the way out to 60 Earth radii. And it's still going out today, and our rotation is still slowing down with time. Now, I'm required to talk about the moon. Uh, this is my job. I work at the Lunar Science Institute. But the moon is really cool. We've all seen pictures like this. We've seen it through telescopes. We see these really big impact basins. We see these little craters all over. The moon's really, really interesting and really, really valuable because after it formed, it was a clean slate. It has had no atmosphere, no winds, no water, no grass, no plate tectonics ever since. The moon's recorded all of the events in the solar system for 4.5 billion years. It's all recorded on its surface today. That's why we're so interested in it. That's why we're so willing to study it. We want to know when these impacts happened, how they happened, what was hitting the moon, all of that, the entire record of all that was going on in the solar system is recorded on the surface of the moon. Oh, please play. Oh, who's seen Armageddon? The opening scene, the, it's happened before. The, <laughs> Paris gets destroyed, because it's always Paris. Uh, and they were talking about the impact that happened 65 million years ago that killed the dinosaurs. But what's important to remember this relationship between the Earth and the Moon. The, the Moon's recorded all of the impacts on its surface for 4.5 billion years. That tells us exactly what's hitting the Earth. The Earth gets 20 times as many impactors as the Moon. We have almost no record of this. Our records go back about 600 million years on the surface of the Earth. There's one or two big impacts from 2 billion years ago that we know about. Before that, we really don't know because of plate tectonics and so on. We can't look that far back in our past on the Earth. And that's why we use the moon to do those sorts of studies. And so that's why we went to the moon. Well, there's a lot of reasons we went to the moon. This is the reason I'm interested in why we went to the moon. We landed our astronauts all over the surface. All of those big black areas on the moon are different impact basins. And we wanted to know how old they were. 
Because when those happened on the moon, 20 of those were happening on the Earth. So what we found, we brought rocks back from all over the surface of the moon, and all of these rocks were melted or shocked all within the same kind of period of time, right around 3.9 or 4 billion years ago. Not much since then, and not a whole lot before that. There was this huge impact spike on the moon 4 billion years ago, and therefore a huge impact spike on the Earth 4 billion years ago. And this has changed the entire way that we look at the dynamics of the entire solar system that we had 500 million years of relative quiet, and then bam, 200 million years of heavy, heavy, heavy bombardment. A period of time called the late heavy bombardment. It's told us a lot about how our solar systems evolved. We can look closely at the moon today because we're going back to the moon. We have two missions orbiting the moon right now. Some of the highest resolution imaging on the moon we've ever got from the lunar, I don't even know its name, LRO. And this is an uh, image of the Apollo 12 landing site. You can see footprints. You can see the Surveyor 3 landing site. This was a big test, Apollo 12, to see how precise they could choose the location to land. They wanted to land by Surveyor, which had been on the moon for two years already, to bring back pieces from Surveyor to see how that material had aged on the moon in those different conditions on the surface, thinking long term about building things on the moon and being on the moon for long periods of time. And from Apollo 17, I believe, you can see the tracks from their little rover they ditched over here, where they drove all around in their little dune buggy on the moon. In case we were skeptical that we actually went to the moon. <laughs> I'm sure none of you are. So this is why we study the moon. This is why I study the moon. It's our Rosetta Stone. It tells us the story of the entire evolution of the solar system. So the implications of this the fact that it took just a single event to build our moon and it wasn't a long period of accretion of little bodies here and here, that it was, at some level, random chance, which isn't very appealing for a scientist that your theory comes down to luck of the draw. And when we run these simulations, sometimes it's Venus that gets hit. So this is unappealing, but it appears to be what happened. And that it shows us that our planets were still getting hit by really, really big impactors at the very end of their growth. When they, were still, when they were building and they were almost fully grown, there were still things the size of Mars floating around smashing into things, which would change their rotation rate, tilt their axes, and so on. All right, moving outwards, we get to the asteroids. These are the leftovers from the, the formation of the planets. We saw this in the movie, where we were building our planets and we had our leftover junk out in between where Mars and Jupiter was. That's what all of these guys are. Jupiter's out here. Mars is right there, Earth is right there. All of these green dots are the asteroid belt. Which immediately, seeing this plot, makes me think about a movie from when I was young. Remember from Empire Strikes Back, when they fly through the asteroid field. And they're dodging, and they're, people are smashing into asteroids nonstop. And looking at that last plot, we might think that, you know, the asteroid belt could be dangerous. How do we get our probes out to Jupiter and avoid all these guys? Well, that is decidedly not the case. Our asteroid belt has very, very little mass. Only on order of 5% the mass in the moon. Most of it, the majority of the mass in the asteroid belt is in a single body series, the biggest asteroid. It was discovered around 1800. For 50 years, it was called a planet because it's just about the only thing we knew in between Mars and Jupiter. It made sense for a planet to be there. We found out that there were millions of asteroids there. And we realized that it's just kind of the biggest of us, big population of bodies. So, this guy's not going to play. Oh, no. I'm not even going to mess with this guy. What we're going to see here, though, like we saw in that last movie that didn't run, when we build our planets here, we're left with our leftovers in our asteroid belt. Our asteroids, which have been in the same location in between Mars and Jupiter for four and a half billion years, are the leftovers of this process. So they tell us what these guys were made out of. And we want to know what the Earth was made out of. We want to know what Mars was made out of. That's what the Earth's made out of. That's where life is. We want to know what those guys are made out of. So our asteroids are a tracer of this process. And we've visited a number of them in the last 20 years now. Uh, starting with Ida. Most recently, we were at Itukawa. Or not most recently. We've been to uh, two since, actually. 
the huge differences in sizes from 30 kilometers across to just 500 meters across Itakawa. Itakawa is a pile of rocks, like you'd have in your driveway, essentially. Almost no gravity, completely disorganized jumble, jumble of rocks. But they're interesting because of the story they tell. And our biggest asteroid, which has been recently upgraded, like I said, it was a planet, it was considered a planet for about 50 years. It got downgraded to an asteroid. It just got a promotion to dwarf planet. Uh, it got that because it's big enough to actually be round. It's, it has, it's large enough, it had enough heat when it was born that it could melt throughout. So the rocky material sunk to the middle, and then there's a big core of water ice frozen on top, and then a crust on top of that. This is a really interesting guy, and we're going to it in two years. Our spacecraft Dawn, which is currently orbiting Vesta, which is a neighbor of Ceres and one of the biggest asteroids in the asteroid belt, completely different. Fully melted, all stone, no water, incredible, awesome cratering history. This right here is a, the remnant of a crater that's the size of almost the entire bottom half of the body. It's filled the asteroid belt with its chunks that we've been studying for 50 years or so, many of which land on Earth. We have samples of this guy on Earth, and we're orbiting it right now, and our spacecraft's going to move on and go to Ceres in three or four years. All right. Like I said, pieces of Vesta have actually made it to Earth meteorites are our samples of these asteroids. These asteroids are a sample of where the planets came from. So studying our meteorites tell us a lot about the actual formation of the solar system. Their compositions, how much water they have, they're tracing the history of the solar system. The problem with our meteorites is by the time they land on Earth, we've lost context. We don't know where in the asteroid belt they came from. When we go to Vesta and we orbit it, we know where it is and we can estimate its history these meteorites, we don't know which asteroid they came from. We don't know where it was born or how it got to us. So they tell a very complicated and confusing story, but they're really valuable. All right, we conquered the inner, or the, the inner stuff. Let's move to the outer stuff. That dude's not going to run. We can live with that. These are our four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Anyone know which one's Uranus, which one's Neptune? Yeah. Where's Neptune? Neptune is that blue one. Blue one, right. Neptune's blue, Uranus green. Saturn, easy with its rings. Jupiter's the big boy we've all seen before. So these guys are vastly different than our planets. Jupiter weighs over 300 times what the Earth does. Its core is made up of 10 times the Earth of solid rocky material. And what our models, what this movie that you're not seeing here shows you, is that when you build up about 10 Earth masses of solid rocky material, you can then start to grab the gas from this disk around the star. Now, we're pretty sure the gas around our star lasted for about 5 million years. That's what we see in other stars throughout the solar system. Since Jupiter and Saturn are mostly gas, they had formed already by the time our gas had gone away. They formed really, really fast in only 5 million years, while the Earth was still a baby. Finally, we move outwards to our small guys. And here's where we get to do some science, all of us. This is the discovery plate from Pluto, discovered by Clyde Tumbaugh in 1929 at Lowell Observatory. Where's Pluto? Yeah, it's one of those dots. All right, um, this isn't fair. We need to see it moving. So I'll show you the other, the other image. Oh, see it? No, I didn't think so. Here. Yeah, I can see it. You see it? This is how Tumba did it. He had two photographic plates on a little blinker back and forth. We still do things like this. So here's a movie. Look for it. Look for it. Oh, I see it. Now. See it? Oh my God. Yeah. It's amazing he wasn't blind. <laughs> One more time. There it is. We have awesome computer algorithms to do this for us today, but it's still really, really hard. Tumba, that's heroic. So we just did our science for the day. That's great. Pluto was the only guy, kind of like Ceres was, is the only guy in the population of bodies beyond Neptune for 80 years, 70 years, until 1993. In 1993, the floodgates opened, and we discovered an entire population of icy bodies out here. And over 15 years, we realized that Pluto, like Ceres is the king of the asteroid belt, with millions of neighbors, 
Pluto is essentially the king of this region called the Kuiper Belt. And it has millions of neighbors just like it. Pluto, a lot like our big asteroid series, rock in the middle, ice on top. Eris was the one that eventually got Pluto dethroned, discovered about five years ago. Uh, in the end, it looks like it's almost exactly the same size as Pluto, maybe not bigger. And Triton, the moon of Neptune, looks a lot like these guys as well. But when we stack them up even against our own moon, our moon is bigger than Pluto. That's how big our moon is compared to our planet. It's bigger than the biggest of the Kuiper Belt objects. Taking one more step, we get to the, the region where our comets live, the Oort Cloud. This goes out to 10 to 100,000 AU away from the sun. This is why some of our comets, like Hale-Bopp, they come in once, and they go back out here, and we'll never see them again in our lifetime. Their orbits take 10,000 years. They're hanging out in this Oort Cloud until the, the torque from the galactic center tilts their orbit enough and they come launching in. We see them, they're big and bright and they're gone forever. So a few years ago, we would have clapped our hands and said, we understand the formation of the solar system. But it's time to reveal uh, a fair bit of dirty laundry. Problem one, we can't make Uranus and Neptune. It just doesn't work. When we run our simulations like we do for our rocky planets, we go nowhere. It would take 100 million years, whereas our gas is only around for 5 million years, and these guys have a lot of gas. Big problem. Jupiter and Saturn, their orbits, they are not circular. If they formed in this gaseous disk, the drag from the gas would keep their orbits perfectly circular. Not even close. Elliptical orbits all over the place. Neptune, very much so. Tilted orbits, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Our Kuiper Belt, it's so little mass out there that it would have been impossible to actually build something as big as Pluto. Pluto's orbit is really weird. It's linked very closely with Neptune. It's kind of a very high eccentricity. It hides from Neptune, essentially. You can only get there if Neptune's kind of been moving around, moving all this material around. Three big problems. But today, we're going to leave these to faith. I'll come back in the summer and talk about these. But we're going to talk about Mars. Because what we skipped when we did our little model of, of the inner solar system was that Mars is actually really small. Mars is half the size of the Earth, a tenth the mass. If we look at where we are relative to the Sun and how big we are, Mercury is really small to detail. Venus, Earth, and Mars out there. It's really not that big. When we run all of our models, for 30, 40 years now, we always build a Mars that's as big as the Earth or Venus. It's always up here. Our Mars is really small. We don't know why. This is, this is a problem. We ignored it when we saw this slide. Shame on you guys. You should have called me out on that, showing you bad science. But we're going to solve it right now. So this was the movie we didn't see earlier, where all of this material accreted together and built our planets. Now, if we look where Earth and Venus are, they're really close to each other. Venus orbits at 0.7 AU from the sun, the Earth at one. They're both big, 10 times bigger than Mars. Mars is out at 1.5 AU and a tenth the mass. It has all of this material to build. It's, it's, of course it's this big in our models. We give it all of this food. It has plenty to eat. So our solution is ditch all this material and starve Mars. All right, maybe this will work. This movie will not work. Pretty sure about that. Oh. Oh. Hmm. All right. What we did is we starved Mars. We took everything from 1 AU outwards. We got rid of it. We did the same models that we did before. We let our big guys grow together, eat all these little guys. Bing, we get a Venus. Bing, we get an Earth. Bam, out here, we scatter a little Mars. This, this could work. This could be our solution. Now, this was proposed in 2009. And when the guy wrote the paper, he said, I've made this model to deal with the Mars problem. If we just had material between 0.7 and 1 AU, we get awesome planets. They match our planets perfectly. This is, this is a great solution. However, I have no idea why material would stop at 1 AU. This was in his paper. 
He had the answer, but he didn't know why it was the answer. So that's a step. So we take a step back and we look at our solar system and now we have thousands of other solar systems to compare it to. We've been discovering planets around other stars for 15 years now. Three main ways. We can actually image them, which is really quite rare. The way that dominated for 10 years, where we look for the wobble in the host star. Because some of these planets are so big, like our Jupiter, as they orbit their host star, they're moving that star back and forth as they both orbit the center of mass. By looking at the, the spectra of that star very closely, we can see a Doppler shift as it moves towards us and away from us, towards us and away from us as that planet goes around it. This was finding lots and lots of planets. Recently, we've launched a spacecraft called the, Ke uh, the Kepler, uh, the Kepler spacecraft, sorry. And what it's doing is it's surveying, uh, I think 200,000 stars in one part of the sky every 15 seconds for five years. Every 15 seconds, take a picture, record exactly how bright that star is to unprecedented precision because it's sitting in space, perfectly cold, never moving, never changing, no weather, no rain, nothing. Staring at those stars, waiting, waiting for a planet to go in front of a star and cause a very slight dip in brightness. Something like one millionth the brightness change. You detect that three times and you've seen your planet go around three different times. This is the, uh, the most recent update on some of their systems. What they found is really, really amazing. 885 planet candidates in 361 systems. These are only the systems in which they found at least two planets. There's a bunch of other systems where they found just one planet. Some of these have up to six planets all inside the orbit of where our Mercury is. Whizzing around their star, really close to each other. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome collection of data. And so what we see when we look at all of these planets and other systems, and we say, all right, where are all the planets that we're finding? Granted, it's really hard for us to find something like Jupiter far from a star, because with Kepler, the orbit of Jupiter is over 10 years. We'd have to watch a star for 10 years to get one dip by one millionth, right? It's way easier to find something that's really close. It goes around in a week. Way, way easier. And that's true for the Doppler shift as well. It's way easier to see something that happens in a month. You watch it for a year, you see it a bunch. But what we see when we look at everything is something that we never, ever expected to see. When we look at how far they are away from the, their star, in the same units that we measure our solar system, where our Earth is here at 1, our Mars is here at 1.5, our Jupiter is out here at 5. We found hundreds of big stars, or big planets the size of Jupiter, really, really close to their star, inside of where Mercury is, orbiting in days, three, four, five days. We also found a bunch out here, right where the Earth is, Jupiter's at 1 AU, big gas giants at 1 AU. What we saw in our solar system is we can only form our gas giants way out far in the solar system, beyond that snow line, beyond 3 AU. So to move something as big and gassy like Jupiter in this close, you can't form it there. You actually have to move it there. So by looking at these other systems, we realized that planets move. So this movie, which I showed you before, but we didn't see, <laughs> showed our giant planet growing and staying still because that's how we modeled it then. 20 years ago, we didn't know any better. We put our planet here and we started growing it. We watched it build, take all the gas, but we didn't let it move. We need to let our planets move. So what we find in, in our recent models is something as big as Jupiter actually cuts this disk in half. It's so big that no gas can get past it. Now these disks themselves are evolving. It's kind of like floodwaters. They're flooding in towards the star where the gas is being accreted. And they're also flooding outwards. By cutting a gap in the disk, Jupiter's caught up in the floodwaters and gets pulled inwards. These disks of gas are way more massive than a planet, way more massive than Jupiter. So Jupiter just gets 
pushed inwards. And that explains why we're finding all of these hot Jupiters in other systems. Now that's great. That is a great explanation. But our Jupiter's out here. It's not in there. So if something like this happened in our system, we've got some explaining to do because we don't find our Jupiter at 1 AU or right next to our star. We find it way out at 5 AU. So we need to understand this. Now what we find in all these other systems is that those planets are usually alone or they have a bunch of small planets inside of them. But when we flip the model and we say, no, we have a Saturn. We have Saturn right outside of Jupiter. So when we drop Saturn into those models and we let them go, when Saturn gets big to about how big it is today, that inward push of the floodwaters can change. Saturn is big enough, it kind of lets gas get past, so it's kind of like the floodwaters are passing them by. And then there's a tidal interaction with the disk, and the two of them get pushed outwards. So for you sailing buffs, we titled something called the Grand Tack, where Jupiter is being pushed inwards, Saturn grows up, gets caught right behind Jupiter, changes the whole dynamics, they turn around and they go back outwards. And we find this in our models. This works. Three or four different groups find this consistently. Now it's hard to see this in those other planetary systems because we can't find things at 5 AU yet. Over 20 years, we'll start to find those guys. But right now, we don't know if there are Jupiter-Saturn pairs in these other systems. But our models show us that this can work. So, what we need from before to form our planets is we need an edge to our disk at 1 AU. We have to have that if we want to get a good Mars. We now have this really useful tool where we say, Jupiter was moving around. Jupiter moves in, it eats all this material, Saturn grows up, and they come back out. This can solve our problem. This is a really potentially useful tool. We get our disk, we get our planets out where they should be. Done, game over. Almost game over. Yeah. And you know, I showed you those pictures of asteroids, and I said that there isn't much mass there, but it's there. Jupiter's really big. Jupiter and Saturn are really big. Driving them through the asteroid belt and sending them back out, there would be nothing left. Nothing left. And beyond that, it's not just that there's things there, it's that it's a complicated place. In the inner part of the asteroid belt, we have what are called S-types. These are dry, rocky asteroids. It looks like these guys were born where the Earth was born, one or two AU. Outside, we have C-type asteroids. These guys are water-rich, they're carbonaceous, maybe 10% water in them, whereas our S-types would have less than a percent, much less than a percent. These guys don't look like each other at all, yet they're neighbors in the asteroid belt. So for hundreds of years, we've tried to explain how these two populations could be born right next to each other, even crossing over, but not look like each other at all. No similarities. So we need to modify our plan here and say, this material that was inside, that Jupiter's gonna clear out to cut this off to form our good planets, those are going to be our S-types, our dry guys. They don't have much water. They're rocky, they're stony, like our rocky planets. But then outside our giant planets, out where we're starting to form our Kuiper belt, our Plutos and so on, we have our wet guys. Volatile rich, lots of water, so on. They match that population in the outer asteroid belt. So, this may seem crazy. Let's put our population of dry guys there, our wet guys there, and let our two planets do their dance. Maybe we'll get lucky, <laughs> or we're good, and we'll build our asteroid belt. Hopefully, somehow, we can bounce these guys around and put them in here. Now, in our first run, when we just had our dry material, we saw that as Jupiter and Saturn came blasting inwards, Jupiter would encounter an asteroid, scattered outwards, Saturn would see it, and it would spit it out behind it. And it'd be out here on an orbit way beyond these two planets as they're down here mixing things up in the inner solar system. But they're relatively stable. And they're sitting there, chilling out. 15% of everything they see get kicked out here. So when these two planets make a U-turn and come back outwards, these guys are going to see them again. So when Saturn comes blasting through this population, it's going to send some guys to Jupiter. 
Jupiter's going to send him inwards. Jupiter's going to keep moving. This guy doesn't need to worry about Jupiter anymore. It's not going to get beat up or eaten. It's stuck. We saw that in our first simulations. All right, what if our, our wet watery asteroids are out here? They're chilling. They don't care about our planets coming inwards. They come inwards, eat all this material from Mars. They turn around, they go outwards. They go outwards, they go outwards. Boom. Those guys are going to suffer the same sort of fate. Saturn's going to see them, send them to Jupiter, and send them back inwards. So here is our entire model. We're looking right down on the solar system. We have our dry, rocky, stony material here. This is the orbit of Jupiter, our orbit of Saturn, orbit of Uranus, orbit of Neptune. We put our wet C-type guys out here, and we're going to let them go. We're going to see Jupiter and Saturn as their orbits change, as Jupiter comes migrating inwards. It's going to come blasting through these dudes and send them all over the solar system. Saturn's going to catch up grow up and get big, they're going to turn around and come outwards. And we're going to need to see a couple of things. Number one, our inner disk is going to get truncated really low. Hopefully, this is what we need to get our planets. And two, in this region right here between these dashed lines, we need to pay attention to what guys end up back there. Because that's our asteroid belt. This region between about 2 AU and about 4 AU is where our asteroid belt is today. And we need to put both our stony, rocky guys and our wet C-type asteroids there. If we can't do that, our model is going to fail. Oh, you're not going to run, are you? Oh, no. <laughs> I apologize. This really is on faith now. Uh, yeah. This is what happened. Yeah, I gave you a pretty good rundown there. We can pop it up now. At the end, we can pop it up uh, alone and play it in QuickTime or something. Because that is kind of the summation, the, the climax of our story. We see, as I described, we truncate that disk. We scatter our asteroids between the asteroid belt. Our planets go out, and our story is almost done. Our inner disk, over time, will grow up and build our rocky planets. Through this process, though, of mixing up with these watery guys out here, not only do they get sent to the asteroid belt, where we see a big population of them today, they also get sent on to orbits that cross our planets that are still growing. So Earth has a fraction of water much higher than the asteroids, our rocky, stony-type asteroids, and the meteorites that we collect from them. Much more water, a factor of 10 almost. So Earth had to get a bunch of water that wasn't in its birth region. We have to deliver water to Earth. And this is a method to scatter these guys who were formed out here beyond the snow line where there was water everywhere and that we find are about 10% water total in their mass. And we scatter about 2% of the Earth's mass in there and have enough mass to account for all of the water on Earth. So we've knocked off our Mars problem, we've refilled our asteroid belt, and we've delivered water to planet Earth. So this is the end of our story. Planet formation is really hard. And this, hopefully, is a step to understanding what happened in our solar system, where our Earth came from, why our Mars is small, where our water came from, which is really important. When we start looking at planets around other stars, we want to know if there's going to be planets like ours if they're going to have water, how many of them they're going to be. We're looking for planets like Earth. And we need to understand where our Earth came from to make that leap. The other big thing is that we've been looking at these other solar systems and finding that their planets are moving all over the place. And not only was it a useful tool to understand how our solar system formed, it also told us that we're a lot like them. Our planets were moving all over the place, too. We're just a subset of the systems that we see out there. We're not necessarily special. We had a lot of things moving around when we were young also. So with that, I'm done. I'm happy to take lots of questions, and we can try to maybe piece by piece bring up the coolest movies since uh, you had to take, my faith, take me on faith there on the last movie that it all worked. <laughs> it was excellent. Thank you.
Sir. Can I have permission to name my band the Hot Jupiters? <laughs> <laughs> I would bet that there's a band named the Hot Jupiters. Oh, it's such an awesome name. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yes, go for it. I want to see the media. Wow. Yeah, pull up that, that last emotions. video. Pardon? Can you pull up that last video? The last video? Yeah. Let's go see the oh. Hot Jupiters. Um, yeah. And we should see the moon forming one. That movie is really, really amazing. Extremely well done. Uh, can't see. I can take questions while I'm looking for this. Fire away. I have a question about um, your model. Sure. Um, you have a computer program on a big ass computer that takes snapshots every 20 seconds and iterates through 4 billion years? Or? Sure. So the, the basics of these models, what we're looking at here, almost all of this is gravity. Mm -hmm. Their orbits around the sun, how the orbits get perturbed by the bigger, larger planets, because they're the next biggest things and they change all the orbits of all the small guys. When these or orbits cross and they accrete to build something bigger, and so on. In this simulation, we have the gravity that like we would have in those, those early ones, where you're watching these pieces build orbit by orbit when they start to collide. So you're just running gravity over time, keeping track of who's colliding with who, where it is, how, it orbits change, how its orbits change. When we get into complicated scenarios like these, we need to do a couple extra things. We need to push our giant planets around. We learned how our giant planets can move in a totally different simulation. It was hydrodynamics of a gas disk around a star. Mm -hmm. That told us how Jupiter and Saturn would be moving inward and outward. We then take that motion, we impose it on our giant planets, and we model the gravity here. Gas, however, can change the orbits of the small guys by acting as a drag force to slow them down, make their orbits more circular, tilt them this way or that way. So we then impose that on our small guys. But that's built into our gravity program. because so we have to take what we learn from the hydrodynamics, the gas models, and, and impose it on our, our gravity program and let that do the rest. All right, so here's our, our movie. Jupiter's blasting inwards. Saturn grows up enough to start moving around. It comes in. They tack. They move out to the outer part of the solar system. You can see our red inner disk, and you can see those blue guys sitting on top of it. We plotted them second so we could see them outlined to show that there's quite a bit of mass of our water-rich guys sitting on top of them, delivered to our growing rocky planets. In our asteroid belt here, if we looked at it as a function of distance, our red guys are dominating on the inner part, the blue guys are dominating in the outer part. It matches that distribution that we find in the actual asteroid belt.